plan to make it harder to haul politicians out of office if Coloradans get fed up with them. Excel's profits are coming out of Colorado far more than any other state. The company explains why. The state's Republican leaders debate whether openly calling each other names is a good strategy. We've got to stop airing our dirty laundry in public. A candidate for Denver mayor promises a crackdown on homeless encampments. You're going to step on some toes, but it's the right thing, and it's the only way to uh, heal our city. And a basketball coach moved by tragedy to serve her community differently. That's tonight on Next. Perhaps you recall that a recall in Colorado is easy to get rolling, just gather enough signatures. It's hard to complete, though, getting the votes to actually remove someone from office. In recent years, failed recalls run by conservatives against Democratic Governor Jared Polis have been good at one thing, collecting the names and addresses of Coloradans. Our Marshal Zellinger looks at a plan to make recalls harder to pull off. Collecting signatures to try to recall a politician has been used to try to undo elections in Colorado. Don't like someone's politics? Let's recall them. Democratic Governor Jared Polis faced two recall efforts, kind of. The people collecting the signatures to get a new election never turned in the signatures. The way it is now, it, it incentivizes recalls when there shouldn't be recalls. Democratic State Representative Lindsay Doherty presented a bill today that, in part, would limit how recall elections work. Under the legislation, if an elected leader were successfully recalled, they could only be replaced with someone of the same political party. She's not even sure it's constitutional yet. If someone does something so unethical or heinous that they shouldn't be able to do this job, then let's recall them. But the, the point shouldn't be, let's recall a person to change the political party. You know, I think they're one step away from just saying, we're going to ban Republicans from going, you know, going for any election. Michael Fields is a conservative who is well-versed in recall efforts. He briefly led an effort to recall State Senator Kevin Priola last year, after Priola changed his political affiliation from Republican to Democrat. Get this, though. Under this bill, because Priola was a Republican when he was elected, he could only be replaced by a Republican if he were recalled, even though he's now a Democrat. And I think it should be up to the people to decide who they want to get rid of, one, and who they want to replace them with, two. And just limiting, you know, the political party, uh, that doesn't stop politics from entering it. This is a political bill. So I think if we're recalling someone, it should be for the right reasons, and I think this essentially takes the politics out of recalls. Well, I reached out to the Attorney General's office, which reviews legislation like this for constitutionality. It's still reviewing it. I asked Fields, if this were to pass, would you bring back your recall effort against Priola, knowing that if you were to win that, he would have to be replaced by a Republican? The short answer is no, because Priola's seat is up again after next year's election, yeah. so the timing's not there, and the cost of collecting signatures, cost benefit, time effort, versus what are you really getting out of the end? It's, it's a non-issue for Priola. And, and this, if I'm not mistaken, would not apply to nonpartisan municipal elections, so like mayor of Denver, city council of Aurora, that kind of School thing. School board races where you don't have a D or an R it would not impact those races. And those are the races that a lot of Republicans are very intently focused on in the next couple of years after having not been able to win anything lately. Right. And so one strategy, if they could get it past voters, perhaps, to change the Constitution, I think it'd be in the Constitution, to get rid of party affiliation in other races. If it works for school board, if it works for city council for mayors where you don't know the D or the R. Maybe it would work for sheriffs. Maybe it would work for county clerks. Maybe it would work for secretary of state or other races that, that Republicans are having a tougher time winning right now because of the R next to the name. That That's genius. If you can't elect Republicans, then hide who's a Republican. I, good thinking. Marshall, thank you. So we told you that XL Energy brought in $1.7 billion in profit last year. A very successful year is what they told investors. Uh, Marshall, who's standing right over there and does not sleep, he just works. He went through XL's recent financial report, which shows that a big chunk of that profit came from Colorado. Customers here generated $727 million of XL's profit last year. XL is across eight states, but Colorado made up more than 40% of the total company profit. XL attributes that Colorado profit margin to, quote, regulatory outcomes and favorable weather. Wendy Lukoski lives in Westminster. She saw her last Excel bill go up to $350, 236 of it from natural gas. Give some of that money back to your consumers. You have tons of people that are struggling. There are, adjust your costs down. Perhaps you recall our Excel reporting here on the Marshall Zellinger Accountability Hour began with explanations of each line in your bill. 
Wendy showed Marshall the most confusing bill he'd seen. Her gas bill covers December 30 to February 1. She wanted to know why her gas charges were on three separate lines, and the answer is pricing. The price changed three times. The last two days of the year, she paid one rate. January, she paid a higher rate. Then in February, Excel had to lower the rate, so for one day on that bill, she paid a lower amount. Two Saturdays from now, Colorado Republicans will pick a new state chair, a person in charge of setting a fresh direction for a party that is at its lowest point in modern state history. The six candidates for state GOP chair debated over the weekend, debated each other, and debated the truth. We have to grow our numbers. We don't have enough numbers to win. That's why we're infighting. Colorado Republicans are split on whether they lost because they lost or lost because elections are rigged. It's not your fault that we lost this election in 2022. It's because of the machines. All six candidates for state GOP chair have cast doubt on the 2020 election results. A few are trying not to say that in public anymore, like former congressional candidate Eric Odlin, who shifted from this. 2020 election, it was rigged, absolutely rigged. To this. Well, clearly Biden won, whether by hook or by crook. If you are curious whether the big lie still has a big hold on the Colorado GOP, take a listen. State chair candidate Aaron Wood. Trump won. Let's okay. play, play this simple. Tina Peters. So I believe that Trump won, yes, absolutely. Dave Williams. Yeah, I do believe that Trump won nationally. And Kevin Lundberg. I think that Biden didn't legitimately win. All six want Colorado's open primary system closed so that unaffiliated voters would be blocked from voting in Republican primaries. And for candidate Aaron Wood, the path to Republican victory also includes blocking affordable housing in the suburbs. It's to pack people in. And if you pack in people in affordable housing, guess what you're going to get? Democrat control in your counties. I like that. I like that a lot. It deserves a good word. I'll talk to myself. Okay. <laughs> So there are people in the suburbs who live on the streets, they live in cars, are crashing at a friend's place, yet shelters are few and far between in the suburbs and food banks often cannot keep up with demand. Our Mark Salinger looks at the lack of resources. On the streets of Arvada, homelessness isn't always obvious, but in suburban Colorado, the number of people living on the streets and in shelters is going up. We suspect that um, we're gonna see more families experiencing homelessness. Cassie Ratliff works with Family Tree in Jefferson County to help people who've been impacted by abuse, violence, and homelessness. She knows there aren't enough resources in the area to help everyone. Homelessness is going up, and we're seeing in Jefferson County um, the rise of first-time homelessness. First-time homelessness increased by more than 250% in Jeffco between 2020 and 2022, from 66 people to 235. Last month, we were there as they counted the number of people living on the streets yeah. this year. Yeah. They expect the number to go up as people who are unhoused move farther from Denver. Homelessness doesn't end at a street or a county or a city, and, they, and people are crossing these lines all the time. About 40% of our 2022 count were first time experiencing homelessness. Um, and so we continue to see that increase. On the other side of the city, Catherine Smith in Arapahoe County shares a similar story. She's the community resources director who also knows she can't help everyone who needs it. We did see an increase uh, through our point in time counts, a significant increase of over 100% in all areas uh, through our point in time count last year. In Denver, there are a lot of voices talking about the homeless. Homelessness knows no boundaries, uh, and so our approach to it really can't either. But well outside the city, places with even fewer resources struggle to keep up. Well, I might not have the resources today. You can bet your butt I'm going to start looking for them and we're going to try to bring them in. So let's talk solutions. Family Tree, who you just heard from there in Jeffco, is developing 85 units of permitted supportive housing. The goal is that if you find a home, it'll lead to a job and more security. Douglas County across Denver has said that the number of unsheltered people is going down there. But even there, where the number of people experiencing homelessness is very low, the number of people unhoused in their shelters is also going up a small amount. They say they're providing more services to people than they used to. So, you know, Mark, I, I think sometimes there's this, this perception that because people have seen encampments in Denver that they assume that if people are unhoused in the suburbs that they must have come from Denver. But, I mean, all kinds of people fall on hard times in different communities and end up on the streets. But it is clear that, like, certain areas have congregate 
uh, encampments more so than others. Yeah, I've heard the theory that people just hop on the light rail from Denver and end up somewhere like Golden, and then there are no services there, so they get stuck there. That can happen, obviously, but I'm told from the folks that you just heard there, those experts who are out on the streets, that that's not necessarily true all the time. They can mm -hmm. take bus routes, they can walk there, take bikes, it, they can end up anywhere. All right, Mark, thank you. The nonprofit House Working and Healthy offers just those things to people living on the streets of the metro area. And the $28,000 that you raised for them through your latest Word of Thanks microgiving campaign is going to help more Coloradans go through that nonprofit's job training and placement program that weaves in alongside mental health support and housing navigation. Your microgiving has not been micro for some time now. You have raised $10.5 million for nonprofits across our state. So I research a number of your suggestions every week. We're looking for nonprofits that would be a good fit financially and in terms of the programs they offer. If you have any ideas, email them to me. Next at 9news.com. The majority of candidates for Denver mayor say they will forcibly clear homeless encampments. For this candidate, it's his only issue. I'm going to solve encampments first because it's, it's the root cause. Thomas Wolf says Denver's tax base is being gutted by the encampments. That's next. Our next conversation is with another candidate for Denver mayor who says homelessness is a problem of dollars and common sense. Thomas Wolf is an investment banker running a single issue campaign, clear the homeless encampments. But now 10 of the 17 candidates for Denver mayor are also promising to forcibly clear the encampments. 10 of the 17. Wolf is focused on the financial impact of homelessness on the city. Our city needs a remedy. Um, there's a humanitarian side, but then there's also, this is fiscal suicide if we do not solve this problem. Talk about that aspect of it. Yeah, so the two, the two biggest drivers um, you can see are our commercial property values. So our central business district, particularly the uptown side, is, is plummeting in value. The second one, the second part of this, is that we have this beautiful, in, in, in um, business we refer, refer to as a flywheel, great economic you know, benefit generator. You know, I th think of the app store. Our app store are the visitors that come to Denver and that the sales tax dollars that that generates, the lodging tax dollars, and they aren't coming back. You know, the data shows they're not coming back because our city is unsafe and filthy. That, you're killing the golden goose here, okay? So you've made the financial case for ending encampments. Convince me that you care about them as people, well, the people who live in them. Yeah, you, you have to start out as, okay, I, I've owned commercial property. I owned commercial property for two decades um, down by the, the first snooze. So 20 years ago, moved back from England, thought it was a good idea, a good investment. The Montforts in the city had just made a half billion dollar infrastructure uh, investment. The shelters and the encampments and the issues there have, have won, hands down. But I, but I asked you about the humanity of the folks who are yeah, living in the so streets. I, you're talking to me I, about real estate. I, I, I know. I know I, when I owned that property, I knew the people that would, would camp or sleep overnight on my property. Alfonso from New Jersey. I could go down a list of all of these people. Um, their need is shelter. You, it, it's, you know, until, they get, until we solve that for them, these are Denver's neediest, okay, and you have to shelter them. I can scale shelter yesterday and I can get that done. So that's, that's the start. And then to the extent that these people start making better life decisions or are able to because they're sheltered, then we can make some headway. Wolf says he would offer progressively nicer shelter to people who are experiencing homelessness when they take steps to address things like drug use and mental health and other challenges. In our full 15 minute conversation, we also talk about Wolf's opposition to rent control and why he thinks the city should tackle social issues with a business mindset. All of our full candidate interviews are available on the next YouTube channel and on 90s.com. And I want to let you know, uh, Thursday on Next, we are going to have the results of our poll on the mayor's race. Oh, it was a beautiful weekend and not a bad way to kick off your Monday. Temperatures sitting in the 50s here for the metro area, 60s, mid-60s down in far southeastern Colorado with a little light snowfall up in the high country. That all pushes back in overnight into tomorrow as another little shortwave digs into Colorado. The center of low pressure still anchored off to the west, slamming the Sierra Nevada range, and then will continue to march inland and hit the Rockies shortly. Here we are looking at clear skies for eastern Colorado, but that snowfall really ramping up overnight, heading up by 70 
early tomorrow morning, it's going to be tricky. Not only are we tracking some heavy snowfall, but also incredibly gusty winds as this system passes through. The snowfall will remain confined to the high country. We're not looking at much here for eastern Colorado, but the advisory is certainly in place for about 5 to 10, 6 to 12 inches of snow. The winds starting to pick up as we look ahead toward tomorrow morning. 20 to 30 mile per hour gusts here in the metro area with 40 to 50 mile per hour speeds up in the foothills. Red flag warnings in place for far southeastern Colorado with 40s lining up the metro area as highs. Our next storm system arriving on Wednesday. She gave up the life she knew when tragedy hit her city. I just felt like I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be a brother or sister to uh, this department. A college basketball coach turned police officer shares her story next. She already had her dream job, coaching D1 basketball at CU Boulder. Yet Jill Mahoney says she felt called to change her career when one horrible moment changed her community. My name is Jill Mahoney. I was a basketball player in high school. Um, I received scholarships to play basketball in college. Ultimately, I worked for who's now the head coach of the University of Colorado women's basketball team, J.R. Payne. A few moves later, she gets the job here at the University of Colorado and calls me and asks me if I want to come. I was the director of basketball operations uh, from 2016 until 2022. Uh, I was sitting on a curb in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, we were at the WNIT, um, which is a women's basketball tournament, and I'm just mindlessly scrolling through Twitter. That's when the King Super shooting was happening. And I remember thinking, I don't have that um, sadness for the community. I had that, but it was this more in depth, I'm supposed to be there. You know, Officer Tally dying. And I just felt like I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be a brother or sister to uh, this department. In my last job, I recruited a lot in terms of, I would have families from all different areas of the world. and. That you do that here, you do that in this job. You're you've got people from all over the world, different ethnicities, different backgrounds. The head coach J.R. Payne is still one of my best friends. Uh, the young women that are still on the team, are, I'm very close with. I cheer them on every single home game that I'm a, that I'm allowed to and available to go to. So that blood runs deep, and I wish them nothing but success. And I'm right there in the stands with them. There's a lot of a lot of incredible men and women in these photos that. Um, I have a duty to make sure that I honor this badge. I always say be where your feet are, and this is where I'm supposed to be at this point in time in my life, and I wouldn't change it for the world. That's a great thought. Be where your feet are. Mahoney's been with the Boulder Police Department since last year. She says it was the only department where she applied. Your feedback tonight is about sending me to prison. Cool. That's next. Most of your feedback tonight is about homelessness and how various people and cities are tackling it. Then this deep cut from Alan Nakamura, who writes in to suggest that some of the Denver mayoral candidates should watch the Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode, Past Tense. Alan, I'm enough of a Star Trek nerd that I know that episode. That's the one where they go back in time to some year in the 2020 San Francisco, I think, and they see that there have been concentration camps set up in every American city to house the homeless. David writes, Kyle Clark should be in prison for the lies and propaganda he has spread over the last several years. The fact that Nine News hasn't terminated him is also a huge problem. David, it could happen every day. The way to find out if it has happened is to tune in next time.